Good morning and welcome to this short act of worship for the 13th Sunday after Trinity. We begin with the collect for the day. Let us pray. Almighty God, who called your church to bear witness that you were in Christ reconciling the world to yourself, Help us to proclaim the good news of your love, that all who hear it may be drawn to you, through him who was lifted up on the cross and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. The Old Testament reading is taken from the prophecy of Ezekiel, chapter 33, verses 7 to 11. Ezekiel 33, verses 7 to 11. So you, mortal, I have made a sentinel for the house of Israel. Whenever you hear a word from my mouth, you shall give them warning from me. If I say to the wicked, O wicked ones, you shall surely die and you do not speak to warn the wicked to turn from their ways. The wicked shall die in their iniquity, but their blood I will require at your hand. But if you warn the wicked to turn from their ways, and they do not turn from their ways, the wicked shall die in their iniquity, but you will have saved your life. Now you, mortal, Say to the house of Israel, Thus you have said, Our transgressions and our sins weigh upon us, and we waste away because of them. How then can we live? Say to them, As I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from their ways and live. Turn back. Turn back from your evil ways, for why will you die, O house of Israel? This is the word of the Lord. The psalm appointed for today is Psalm 119, verses 33 to 40. Psalm 119, verses 33 to 40. The response to the psalm. My delight shall be in your commandments. My delight shall be in your commandments. Teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes, and I shall keep it to the end. Give me understanding, and I shall keep your law. I shall keep it with my whole heart. My delight shall be in your commandments. Lead me in the path of your commandments, for therein is my delight. Incline my heart to your testimonies, and not to unjust gain. My delight shall be in your commandments. Turn away my eyes, lest they gaze on vanities. O oh, give, li give me life in your ways. Confirm to your servant your promise, which stands for all who fear you. My delight shall be in your commandments. Turn away the reproach which I dread, because your judgments are good. Behold, I long for your commandments. In your righteousness give me life. My delight shall be in your commandments. The New Testament reading is taken from Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 13, verses 8 to the end. Romans chapter 13 Verses 8 to the end. Owe no one anything except to love one another. For the one who loves another 
has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment, are summed up in this word, love your neighbour as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbour, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. Besides this, you know what time it is, how it is now the moment for you to wake from sleep, for salvation is nearer to us now, nearer to us now than when we first became believers. The night is far gone, the day is near. Let us then lay aside the works of darkness and put on the armour of light. Let us live honourably as in the day, not in revelling and drunkenness, not in debauchery and licentiousness, not in quarrelling and jealousy. Instead, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. This is the word of the Lord. Alleluia, Alleluia. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. You have the words of eternal life. Alleluia. The Lord be with you. Hear the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. If another member of the church sins against you, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. If the member listens to you, you have regained that one. But if you are not listened to, take one or two others along with you, so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If the member refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if the offender refuses to listen even to the church, let such a one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly I tell you, if two of you agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. This is the Gospel of the Lord. May the words of my mouth and the thoughts of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. What should the Christian community be like? Well, first and foremost, we are a community of people who are called to be holy, a people set apart for God. And so how we deal with sin in the church is a really important element when it comes to ensuring that we are indeed seeking to be a people who are different. Because people who are not yet part of the Christian family are quite rightly looking to see if we really are walking the talk of faith, that we are those who are living in obedience to our Lord's commandments in the power of the Holy Spirit. If people generally have high expectations of those elected to serve in political office in our country, expecting them to be people of integrity, honesty, uprightness and not hypocritical, how much more do they expect those who call themselves Christian believers to be exhibiting in their lives the fruit of the Spirit? 
The church is, of course, a fallible human community, marred by the effects of sin. In modern times, this has sadly been exemplified all too frequently by particular church leaders failing to live up to God's moral standards in various ways. But the effects of original sin are evident in the lives of all of us. So there are times when persistent sinful behaviour needs to be dealt with. No church is perfect. As the late Billy Graham once put it, if you find a perfect church, don't join it, you'll spoil it. So how are we to go about dealing with serious sins that arise within the Christian community? Well, in our Gospel reading this morning, we find some indication of what we are to do when sin persists in a church community. Now, we need to note that there is a variation in the verse which opens this passage. In the version we read from, the NRSV, the New Revised Standard Version, the text says this, If another member of the church sins against you, Whereas a footnote to the passage mentions that other ancient manuscripts just say if another member of the church sins. It's a crucial difference, of course, because the focus of the former is on disputes between members of a church, whereas the latter focuses in on the way in which a church is to deal with persistent sin amongst its members. And according to scholars, it seems that the alternative rendering of the text is probably the original, if another member of the church sins. So the instruction here is that if someone is persisting in sin, the person who has wandered away into sin needs to be confronted directly, but initially in private. They are to be approached in love, they are a fellow believer after all. Right attitude is important. And the aim is to get the person who has fallen into sinful behaviour to listen and understand that what they are doing is wrong in order that they might be brought to repentance. Sin is not to be tolerated and simply allowed to fester. If the offender fails to listen, even after the matter has been brought before the whole church community, then they are to be given the cold shoulder, as it were, or as we might say, sent to Coventry. There can be no real fellowship with someone who persists in doing wrong. But even here the hope is still that the person will come to their senses and turn from their sin. Now, although this is a last resort, it might seem a little harsh, particularly when the one expelled is to be regarded as a Gentile and a tax collector. But when we think about it, what was Jesus' attitude towards tax collectors and sinners? He actually demonstrated love and compassion towards them, calling them to repentance, to turn back to God. And so the same is true for those ostracised from the Christian fellowship. The hope of forgiveness and reconciliation is still held out to them. In all of this, the main concern is not with the punishment of an offence, but rather with the attempt to rescue a brother or sister whose sin has put them in danger of wandering away from Christ. After all, in the midst of our concern about dealing with the sinful behaviour of others, we always have to recognise our own sinfulness and our own constant need for God's mercy and grace. Now this teaching might seem to us to be quite difficult to put into practice. It perhaps sits uneasy uneasily with our more restrained, less confrontational, uh, less confrontational approach, which tends to characterise our British culture. 
But I do think that the issue is one which we need to contemplate. Because in the church in this country today, there are certain people in positions of leadership who are all too ready to allow believers to make compromises with the world. They call what is sin not sin, and they try to find all sorts of ways of trying to justify their approach. We have to be aware of such thinking and hold fast to the faith delivered once for all to the saints. And there are a couple of other things to note in all of this. Firstly, any attempts to deal with such issues within the Christian community are to be bathed in prayer. As the Lord reminds us, he is with us in the midst of these difficult situations. What's more, this teaching must never be detached from the Apostle Paul's command to love one another. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. And secondly, it's important that the church maintains a clear distinction between right and wrong in these situations. There is a right way in which disciples ought to behave and a wrong way which we are to reject. In this regard, I do think we need to carefully distinguish between judgment and discernment. One of those catchphrases of our contemporary society is don't judge me, by which is actually meant you have no right to tell me I'm doing something wrong. There's nothing wrong with me. There's even a trend amongst some younger people of getting a tattoo etched on their arm saying only God can judge me if only they realised what a dangerous statement that is to make if they really meant it. In the midst of all this, though, Christians must continue to clearly discern between what is right and what is wrong, between what is sin and what is not sin, in accordance with God's word, expressed in a loving way, and in full recognition of our own sinfulness and not be led into thinking that this is about being judgmental. The two concepts need to be separated, judgment and discernment. God takes sin very seriously and so must we. The Old Testament reading from the prophecy of Ezekiel perhaps serves to underline some of these issues. Ezekiel was prophesying at a time when the people of Judah, God's chosen people, had been substantially taken into exile in Babylon in the 6th century BC. The holy city of Jerusalem with its temple, their central place of worship, having been destroyed by the Babylonian invaders. And all of this on account of the people's sinful rebellion against God. Yet, even in the midst of exile, the Lord commands his prophet to call upon the people to repent, to turn back to him. And we can note here that, first of all, so seriously does God take sin that even Ezekiel himself, will be held to account should he fail to declare the message of repentance to the people. Secondly, there's a recognition that the people are coming to acknowledge their sinfulness and as a consequence are falling into despair. Our transgressions and our sins weigh upon us. How then can we live? And thirdly, we find an assurance of God's mercy and forgiveness to all who truly repent. As God declares to them, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from their ways and live. As people of the new covenant, we know that the ultimate guarantee of that forgiveness comes through Christ's death on the cross for our salvation. 
Today, the concept of sin is something which people in Western societies often try to evade. I'm a good person, not like so-and-so. And so some of that tendency tends to, uh, t- tendency to water down the reality and seriousness of sin in our lives has even filtered through to the liturgies we use for worship in the Church of England. Just compare, for instance, the confession we use on a Sunday morning at St. Bottles, part of the common worship liturgy. Compare that with the profound sentiments expressed in the equivalent in the service of evening prayer in the 1662 Book of Common Prayer. It begins with an acknowledgement of sin. Almighty and most merciful Father, We have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against thy holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done. And we have done those things which we ought not to have done. And there is no health in us. Then a plea for God's mercy. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us miserable offenders. Spare thou them, O God, which confess their faults. Restore thou them that are penitent, according to thy promises declared unto mankind in Christ Jesus our Lord. Then an expression of our desire to live according to God's way. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous and sober life to the glory of thy holy name amen when it comes to sin this is pretty uncompromising but as the apostle paul exhorts us once again in the letter for in our reading from romans we are to lay aside the works of darkness and put on the armor of light to put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh, that's to say our sinful inclinations, to gratify its desires. Now there are various methods we can adopt to share the good news of Jesus with others today, which engage with people in our society in an effective and relevant manner. Hellfire preaching is really no longer appropriate nor desirable. And in turn, there are different aspects of the gospel message which different individuals will find particularly attractive to them. Nevertheless, sooner or later, all people have to come to a realisation of the reality of sin, the need to repent, to receive God's mercy and forgiveness and to commit themselves to living godly lives in the power of the Holy Spirit. Ultimately, uh, underlying all of the Lord's instructions to his followers here is something much wider, the matter of holiness. What does it mean for us to be a holy people? Every week we recite in the creed that we believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Holiness is one of the four key characteristics of us as God's people, the community of Christ. So we need to be constantly open to the transforming power of the Holy Spirit in our lives changing us more and more into the people God wants us to be. The church is, after all, the place where Jesus is himself mysteriously present. He is in our midst, both when we are gathered together for worship and when we're out in the world, seeking to live and work to his praise and glory. Let us pray. 
God our Father, we thank you that you have called us to be a holy people, set apart to serve you in the world. As we seek to faithfully uphold the moral standards set out in your word, may we be ever mindful of our own sinfulness and our constant need for your mercy and grace. In Jesus' name. Amen. And we conclude with the words of the grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.